Any, anything is an option. Okay. And I'm recording now, just so you know. So no swearing, people. Um, yeah. So I know we've talked about stuff on like showing off growing spaces and things like that. I don't know if anybody's willing to do that, Harry. Harry. <laughs> Harry, do you want to show off your beautiful grow room next month? Uh, sure. Although you, you and I will have to sort of figure that out because I think I'll need to film it. I don't think it makes sense to have somebody come in, come in and hold the camera. So right. why don't you and I do a trial in the next several days and see if it actually works? Okay. That's, I know. I was thinking about that too, in terms of, of like somehow, um, cause all, most of my orchids are down in, in the tanks down in the cellar and it's right next to the very loud furnace. And I'm thinking how, how would that work? I mean, I, I, Kelly, you never saw my, um, the manual I made for how to do a Zoom session, but it was it was me, photo, pictures of me on this computer, on the big computer, on my iPad and on my phone are all like one Zoom meeting at the same time. So I, somehow that could happen. Um, it would be interesting, <laughs> but we could try. Maybe like in, in April or May when the heat Alexa, is often. Timer for 20 minutes. So Susie, let's let's leave it this way. Why don't you and I get together next week? We can talk after this. Okay. See if we can actually, we'll do a trial, see if it actually works. And then and I can do a, uh, how to set up a basement grow space. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, so that would be great. You know, we, you know, who knows beyond March, uh, but <clears throat> it's kind of day by day at this point. Here's my little Oncidium blooming. Oh, that's nice. Does it smell, Peter? Yeah, it does smell. It has vanilla, kind of old-fashioned smell. Yeah. Oncidium Tsiku Marguerite, number one. Oh, that is yeah. that's it's been It's been in spike for months, so it finally all opened. Mm. <laughs> a little yeah. hard to see, but it's a great orchid because one, two, three, four, yeah. five, six, seven spikes. That's awesome. Okay. Now, Peter, how do you keep the leaves from getting all spotty? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> this, this one just doesn't seem to happen that way. You're lucky. Yeah. It's beautiful. Some things are spottier than others. Yep. I have one more show and tell. Oh, you do? Okay. Hang on. My Angracum here. Hang on. Let me make you spotlight. There okay. we go. This mm. nice and great one that someone gave me at, at a meeting who said that she couldn't fit it because it was too too big. Uh, it came from the Morrison Center, so I'm not quite <laughs> sure which kind it is, but it's it's similar to Sesquipedalia, but I think it's a hybrid. It's beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> and fragrant as well. Mm. Yeah. That's me. You're growing these in your house? Well, you know, I have my little grow space. Uh -huh. Cool. Yeah. There is a, um, up on YouTube in the public part of the, of the Maine Orchid Society, uh, years ago, I filmed Peter's grow space. A long, yeah, how many years ago was that? Was I it? don't know, about 10. I, I remember seeing it. Yeah, yeah. It, it's still there. It's in, it's in the public part. And the space is still there. <laughs> Are you growing under lights, Peter? I do. I do have some lights in it there, but mostly it gets it gets good morning sun. So I have some lights, and I have a fan. And and this year I got a humidifier, that, which seems is to that, really like is it help you? people. Yeah, I could put together maybe a, a two or three minute thing of uh, showing what I have growing in Puerto Rico. Uh, oh, we'd love to see from, that there. That would be awesome, Dale. It, it wouldn't be very long, but uh, could try That's, to do something with it. We, yeah. we can all look at it and cry and be jealous yeah. because we know it's beautiful <laughs> and lovely there. Hey, yeah. Dale, are, are you guys going down there this year? Not that, the, it's not on the radar yet. Yeah. <laughs> no. And uh, yeah. Oh. yeah. Everything's in slow mo. But, Dale, Dale is the like, only member. Of the Maine Orchid Society, who never sees his orchids bloom. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Wow! 
I've got I've got one that blooms every summer, and the only way I see it is the the fellow who mows the lawn takes a picture and sends it. Oh, uh, Kelly, you, you understand he has a place in Vieques out yeah, there. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. I have a problem. I have too many orchids in my greenhouse. I can't move in there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Grow miniatures. I do grow miniatures. I got about 170 of them hanging everywhere. Nice. Oh my wow. gosh. Here comes Richard. We're still getting people coming in. David, I think you need an intervention, buddy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Either that or a plant sale. That could be the intervention. Yeah, well, I, I do have a lot of divisions mounted that, that I need to sell some of the, one of these days. If we ever all get back together again. It'll happen. Yeah. It will happen. Yeah. I'm optimistic. Even even this summer we can we can meet outside somewhere, you know. I had a nice uh, yes. Maxillaria saffronitis mounted on a deer skull, and the growth on it was so in, enormous all around the skull. The only thing you could see coming out was the two antlers, <laughs> and it was just totally covered with red flowers for the New Hampshire oh, wow. meeting. Oh, wow. they're just starting to go by now. No, I'm going to have to come over to your house once this, the COVID thing is done. I'm going to have to come over to your house with my, my little camera and my little weirdo photo set up and take some serious photos of your plants because they're really cool. Yeah. They really are, Dave. They're fantastic. The ones on the deer antlers, uh, deer skulls, that's just so cool. So, um, David, to be serious for a second, when you mount those things on deer skulls, antlers, whatever, it's got to be the the calcium uh, that's in the bones that makes those orchids grow so well? Yeah, it, it happened. I think that helps a lot. And what I do now with a lot of my smaller mounted orchids that come on a small piece of bark, as they get bigger and need to go to a bigger mount, I'm taking the bark mount and I'm actually gluing it with silicone on the surface of a flat antler. And then the roots go off the bark and go onto the antler and they do really well that way. Because the, the roots really just seem to, they, they go for that, for those bones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. It ends up, they really adhere to it sometimes, but they grow well. They really adhere to them. Moss Harry. grows pretty good on them too. Harry, this it, is it bodes well for all of our eternal futures. <laughs> <laughs> That's... Harry, this is, this is the one that uh, you mounted for me on the bark last summer. Yeah, I think it was it was uh, last summer or the summer before, and it's uh, it's growing quite well. Yeah, we got to find a deer skull for it; it'll grow better. Yeah. <laughs> what what is it? A brassavola? Is that what it is? Um, I've lost the tag. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, Harry knows what it is. He needs to see. I may have known at one time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We probably ought to get on to Kelly, guys. Okay. Yeah. All right. So um, I am going to put Kelly in the spotlight. I'm going to mute everybody else. Oh, wait, wait, let me do my intro first. Okay. So let me do an intro. So I've been on Facebook for a long time. All my lifetime of friends all seem to show up there. And I discovered all the orchid groups, which was very helpful. And then somebody mentioned something in one of the orchid groups about this lady who had a live stream on Thursday nights. And so I started attending and I know some of you also attend. And so before I came upstairs, I counted all the blue tags I have. <laughs> and I think about, um, I think roughly about 65% of the orchids I own, I got from you. And, oh my. and I'm very, I'm very excited that you decided to, to do presentations because what I've always enjoyed and I can show you all is that you are so knowledgeable and I take so many notes <laughs> of orchids. I mean, this is all the stuff that I write down while you're talking about plants and it's been very, very, very helpful. So, um, so ladies and gentlemen, this is Kelly McCracken of High Desert Orchids. And I'm going to mute everybody and then unmute you, Kelly. Okay. You can like, I'll make sure I see you first. Can I share my screen yet? There you are. Okay. Oh, and then I'm going to unmute you. Whoops. 
Where'd you go? Hang on a sec, I gotta find you. There you are. Okay, I'm unmuted. Okay, perfect. Won't let me share my screen though. Um, okay. Ha ha, all right. I know I see your screen. Oh, wait a minute. It's gonna let me share mine, no. I thought. Maybe you have to make me host. That's what I have to do, okay. Now did it again, hang on. Zoom life. I know. Um, where do I make you host? It's me. I've watched plenty of Zoom presentations, but I haven't. I know. Many. Susie, you can't give her permission to share? I'm trying. Wait, hang on here. Where's me? I'm trying and I can't figure out where to, I've done it before. How many times have I done this before? It drives me crazy. Okay, so hang on, let me remove the spotlight and see if that does anything. Gallery, where'd you go? There you are, three dots. Make host, there it is. Yeah, I had to get down to this one. There you go. And now I am the host. And I'm spotlighting you. And then I'm going to. You're going to mute yourself? Yeah, I'm going to mute myself. OK. And here's my presentation. Can you guys see that? Give me a thumbs up, maybe. Yes. OK, I see Dale. He says thumbs up. Excellent. Oh, now, why won't you do this? There it is. Okay, so thank you so much for the intro, Susie. Uh, I specialize in miniature orchids, both professionally what I what I sell and both personally with what I grow. So Susie mentioned me on Facebook. I started my business about three years ago, uh, starting selling exclusively on Facebook. And uh, Susie mentioned my live stream sale. That's still ongoing and I'm gonna have the first one of the year this Thursday. So if you guys wanna join us, you can just search me High Desert Orchids on Facebook. And uh, that live stream sale starts at eight o'clock your time. Uh, oops, somebody's coming in. He's allowed in. Um, so you can, it's kind of like a QVC for shopping. You can buy by entering comments into the, the video and it'll send you a little cart and you can check out. So it's pretty nifty. But I also have a website, which is highdesertorchids.com. How do we advance this slide here? Come on now. There we go. How did I make it advance? Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so I'm also on highdesertorchids.com. I do a weekly website release every Thursday at 4 p.m. your time, your guys' time. So all of the new items appear on the website at once at four o'clock. And here's my contact information. If you guys have any questions from today's presentation, I'm Kelly at highdesertorchids.com. And if any of you are on Instagram, this is my Instagram handle. I don't know if you guys do Instagram, but I sure do. So my business, like I said, I started about three years ago and we started growing out of this little greenhouse. My husband and I built it together. It's an eight by 10 greenhouse and I still grow in here. I, I still have quite a number of orchids in here, but um, now we've expanded. So here's the inside. Uh, Harry asked me to introduce myself and explain how I got started in orchids. And um, I'm sure like a lot of you, I got started by stumbling on my local orchid guilds annual orchid show and they had this tiny little case of orchids they were all miniatures and they had the cutest little show and orchis gemata in that case and it just had one little inflorescence on it with tiny little flowers and i always liked tiny things i always you know whenever my dad took me to the hardware store i would always find 
the tiniest screws and the tiniest nuts and bolts to play with when I was a kid. And then discovering these tiny miniature orchids, I was just absolutely enchanted. And uh, I always thought that orchids were just one kind of plant, you know, like a lot of us probably thought that Phalaenopsis were just it and you didn't have any other options. But then I discovered these tiny little plants and I bought like a dozen plants and I've been buying plants practically every week since then, which was like 10 years ago. So as you can see, I've amassed quite a lot of, of plants in my greenhouse here. This picture was taken shortly before we expanded. So it's, it's really crowded. Uh, this is the other side. It's just a mess. It's a little bit better now that we've expanded. There's more breathing room, but I counted in here you know, when this picture was taken, how many plants there were. And this right side that you're looking at right now, I counted about 1700 plants. So how do I grow 1700 plants in an eight by 10 greenhouse? Well, you grow tiny plants, you grow one inch pots, you know, in the space that a big old standard cattleya like this one in the corner here, I could grow 100 tiny little plants. And so you really get more flower power per square inch when you grow tiny little plants instead of this one big standard cattleya, which if you're lucky blooms twice a year. And with miniatures, you know, they have all different seasons and all different flowers and you just get a lot more flower and more bang for your buck, so to speak. So just like you guys, I couldn't stop buying orchids and buying miniature orchids means that I get to I get to buy more plants and I get to see more flowers and I get to have more fun with my plants. So this is where we're at now. We grow in a um, high bay industrial warehouse space and it's all under artificial light. So we've got these eight benches here with uh, LED top bar lights running along, along the top. And uh, it was a roofing company before we moved in. So it's kind of a unique growing space. This is our uh, mounted orchid area. We call this the light tunnel or some of my customers call it the tunnel of temptation. This is where I grow all of the mounted orchids and um, like along the top you can see the the LED light running down the middle and it illuminates this whole area. There's four LED lights up on top and so this this top band here gets really bright light and then it's much shadier down on the bottom. And we've got some other aeroids and other things that grow in the in the area too. So my talk really focuses on miniature orchids that are three inches and smaller. Some people say minis are six inches and smaller, but I think that the, the cutest and the most fun reside in the three inches and smaller. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the environments that they grow in and also talk about how to best cater your environment to your plants. Uh, you know, all of the plants in my talk are plants that I've cultivated and I've um, propagated and sold for many years, so I'm comfortable with their, their, um, their environments and their cultures. And so I'm going to talk about maybe some hacks for growing them that I've learned and that some of my customers use for growing these plants. And I also want to teach you some resources for learning about your plants, uh, some great websites, and then I'll really try and leave you with a wish list of plants that you know that you can grow. So uh, orchid species, growing miniature species is, um, or teaching about miniature species is maybe a little bit difficult. I get a lot of people that hear that I specialize in miniatures and they say, oh, is it true that minis require more water or is it true that minis require less light? And I always kind of take a step back when I hear a question like that, because, well, no, the, there's just no way to give a blanket statement about miniature plants like that. Um, they're just as diverse as large species. The, the environments that they're found in in nature and um, you know the ways you need to take care of them is just as diverse as, as the large species, if not more so. You know, there's tons of tiny plants in Ecuador that we haven't even discovered yet because they're so small. So the diversity, it maybe is even greater than, than with the large species. So we need to be aware that each species has its own culture and be aware that it might be different from the plant that looks very similar to it. Uh, Orchidspecies.com is probably my favorite uh, free resource for learning about orchid species. 
uh, this is just orchidspecies.com. 99% of the species on the market today that you can buy easily, you're going to be able to find information about them on this website. Uh, you might also see it listed as IOSPE, and that's the Internet Orchid Species Photo Encyclopedia. It's kind of like Wikipedia for orchid species. Uh, there's a lot of different authors that contribute to this page, and there's these authors are constantly editing and auditing the page to make sure that the information is correct. Um, so there's you know thousands of species that are listed on here. They're all alphabetical. You can find them by section. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting information uh, on this website and it's all free. So if you Google a species name, I guarantee one of the top 10 results on Google is gonna be this website. So it's easy to use and it's free. Uh, the important thing that you wanna pay attention to when you're looking up a species is these icons up here. And then usually the first two lines in their description. So this, these first two lines usually tell you where it's found and then the altitude. And if it's of course a miniature, which is always important when we're shopping for miniatures. And it'll tell you its temperature that it grows in. And this is important information. This isn't something that we can just guess by looking at the plant usually is what temperature it grows at. Um, and then usually they'll tell you if it's fragrant or not. And Dendrobium bilatulum, by the way, smells like apples, which is fun. So this information, the temperature, and then how much light it needs is really invaluable. Um, not all you know, orchid shopping websites are gonna give you that information. So if you're trying to determine whether or not you can grow this plant, you can look up the, the temperature information on orchidspecies.com. So it's a great free resource. So taking care of species is all about knowing your environment. And this is really the difference between a novice grower and a more advanced grower is being able to tell me what your temperature, light and humidity are. I often ask people, okay, how are you growing the plant? What's your environment like? And they'll tell me, oh, it's growing on an east window and I water it once a week. This information isn't really helpful to me because your east window is going to be different than my east window, especially if you have a bush or a tree in front of your window or maybe a curtain that you didn't tell me about, something like that. Um, so you, you need to know your temperature and your light and then your humidity. So for temperature, I've kind of split this up into three categories. I'm sure we've all heard this before, but um, cool, intermediate, and warm, and you can certainly kind of fudge fudge these lines a little bit. You know, there are certainly cool intermediate growers and intermediate warm growers, et cetera. These numbers on the left here, 45, 55, 65, these are your winter nighttime low temperatures. So this is the lowest temperature that your plant really wants in the, the depths of dark winter. Uh, and then the number on the right is the summer daytime high temperature. So your plant isn't gonna be getting you know, this 30 degree temperature difference every night year round, that's unnecessary. But, um, you know, in winter, you're gonna want your low to be this number or approaching this number. And then in your summer, you don't want your plants to get above this number. So I grow intermediate. I grow both of my greenhouses intermediate. I find that I can kind of get away with growing cooler growers, and I can also get away with growing some slightly warmer growers. So intermediate is a good starting place if you're, if you're looking to growing species. Um, no matter what temperature you're gonna be growing at, you're gonna need a temperature drop of 10 to 15 degrees at night. Um, most orchids and um, especially a lot of the species really need that 10 to 15 degree drop at night. The pleurothalids, a lot of the dendrobiums, they really like that, that drop at night. So if you're, you know, your summertime high gets to 85, you're going to want to hit 70, 75 at night all throughout the summer. That can be a little bit challenging if you're growing indoors, but you can figure it out. So how do you know what your temperatures are? It's really easy. You buy one of these. I'm sure you've seen it before, but if you haven't, I want you to pull out your phones and buy it right now. It costs $10 on Amazon. This tool, this little tiny box is just invaluable. It'll teach you a lot about your environment. And I'm gonna ask you later if you bought it. So buy one, do it. I see you, Terry, go buy it. 
So I want uh, you to take a look and you see it's got the relative humidity up here and then it's got the um, temperature down here. So this is your current temperature. And then the valuable information about this particular hygrometer is that it tells you your lows and your highs over 24 hours. So nobody wants to wake up at 4 a.m. and um, go check out what the temperature on their orchids is. So this little thing is going to keep track of that for you. So you can wake up and you can see, oh, I got to 65 at night and then I got to 75 during the day. So you can know that you have a temperature difference of 10 degrees and your, your environment might be a little bit warm, you know, or it might be more intermediate if you get cooler during the winter time. So you can kind of determine what your temperature um, what your temperature climate is, and you can decide what orchids can grow for you. Temperature is one of those things that's more expensive and more tricky and more difficult to fix. So um, instead of trying to fix your environment to your plants, you want to buy plants that are suited to your environment. You're going to be happier, your plants are going to be happier, and you're going to get more flowers rather than trying to by plants that don't quite work in your environment. The next thing is uh, light. Light's a little bit tricky to talk about, especially because a lot of us are growing under artificial light these days, myself included. I just used foot candles up here because um, we're, we're familiar with foot candles. As orchid growers, that tends to be what, what the cultural advice is listed in. Um, so again, I just split this up into shady, medium, and bright. We're all familiar with, um, with these numbers. So being aware of how much light your space gets is going to tell you what plants you can grow there. So if you're getting you know, only morning east light, it might not be enough light to grow something like a, a standard Cattleya or a big Brassavola, those things that need a bunch of light. Uh, so if you're using a single natural light source. You can kind of use your hand to determine how much light you have. Hold your hand about 12 inches above the plants and check out your shadow that's cast on the plants. If you have all five fingers that have a really sharp outline, then you have brighter light. If you have all five fingers and it's kind of fuzzy on the, the sides of your fingers, you have more medium light. If you just see a blob and you don't see your fingers at all, Maybe you have shadier light. Um, being aware of how much light you have and how much light your plants are getting is going to be really important in deciding what plants can grow there. Uh, I put my artificial light values. Uh, this is written in PAR or PPFD. Uh, understanding this number is a little bit complicated, but if you research PAR, it's um, photosynthetically active radiation. So this is for measuring artificial light. Um, if you're not familiar with these numbers, uh, I, I would love to explain them to you, but I have a different talk on artificial light. So you'll have to invite me back if you want to hear my talk on artificial light. But um, if you Google PAR, you can get a kind of general understanding of these values. But basically, this is um, 40 micromoles for low light, 150 micromoles for medium light. This is, this is what we grow our medium light plants at. And then the highlight plants would be much higher at 250 micromoles. So for reference, 250 micromoles, that's about 12% um, sunlight. So it's quite a bit less than natural light, but um, it tends to be enough because the intensity of the light is, is brighter throughout the day with artificial light. All right, the last thing is humidity. Humidity is kind of a bad word here in New Mexico. Um, we're considered high altitude desert, hence my business name, High Desert Orchids. Uh, so the relative humidity here tends to be about 12 to 15 percent. So it's a difficult climate to grow orchids in. Um, so a lot of our members will grow in terrariums or light shelves with like a curtain around it. But you need to be aware of your humidity and what you can actually provide for your plants. And don't lie to yourself by thinking you can grow a Mastivalia on a windowsill, because here in New Mexico, we can't do that in 12% humidity. You need to be aware of your humidity and be honest 
with what you can grow in your humidity. So here's my um, terrarium. This is in my living room and there's no special uh, temperature control on this, this, this um, terrarium here. So I've got my little hygrometer thermometer up in the corner and then I've got a single computer fan. I could probably put another fan in there and it wouldn't, um, it would be better, but ah, I'm lazy. And then I have a uh, hygrometer that, that um, hangs out over here and the hygrometer triggers the humidifier, which is outside of the tank, but it has a little tube that pumps into the tank. So when the humidity goes below a certain threshold, it turns on the humidifier and it fogs this whole tank. And it's kind of neat to watch. Uh, so I've got this hygrometer up here and this tells me the daytime and nighttime um, temperature differential. It's, it gets to be about 65 at night and 70, 73 during the day. So it's not a great day to nighttime temperature drop. Pretty much all I can grow in here is the warm growing pleurothalids and um, phalaenopsis. I, so I know that this, this grow area is warm because it doesn't get below 65 degrees even in the winter time. So I grow warm growing things in this terrarium versus my grow space outside gets much cooler. So I can grow much cooler growing things in there. This one is all the rage on Facebook. This is a friend of mine in Tucson. So he grows warm things outside in his greenhouse. And then he's got this inside of his house, which is more of an intermediate grow space because he's got the air conditioner going on inside. And so it's basically the same setup. It's a clear Ikea cabinet and he's got some weather stripping in there and he's got a little grow light and it's the same principle. He's got a humidifier that's hooked up to a humidistat and um, he just caters that humidity to whatever plants are growing in here. So it's pretty neat. And these Ikea cabinets are pretty affordable too. You know, they're a hundred bucks or so for a cabinet of this size. So this is a great solution for adding humidity. And then this is my employee, Warren. He's also here in Albuquerque with low, low humidity, but he's got this tent. And these tents are, um, they were really invented for cannabis growing, for pot growers, but people have adapted them to uh, light growing, you know, houseplant growing. And or they're great for orchids because they seal that humidity. And this little flap here is like a, a zipper flap. And so you zip that shut and it's got this foil shiny stuff around the inside. And so these lights up top, once he zips this, this shut, that light just reflects all around in this grow tent. And so he's got great humidity in there because it's shut and he's got a humidifier. And then he's got great light because the, the light is reflecting all around the tent. So he doesn't have to worry about one big intense light source. And then he's got great climate control because he's got it in a in an unheated room. So he's, it, you know, it gets cooler than his house, but it's still attached to his house so it doesn't freeze. So it's a really great um, intermediate growing environment. It's pretty neat. And these are very affordable. So did you buy this yet? I still want you to buy it. This is important. So now this part of my talk, I just wanted to show you guys some, some species, some pictures of some species and uh, you know accumulate that wish list of things that you want to grow. So this is a really great starter species orchid. Uh, this is Dendrobium aberrans and it's the smallest member of the Latoria section Dendrobium. Most of the Latorias are from Papua New Guinea and uh, they're pretty unusual that they don't require any kind of a winter rest. Excuse me. A lot of the Dendrobium species, they, they need a, a cooler, drier winter, but not the Latoria dendrobiums. This one only gets about four or five inches tall. Uh, the flowers are wonderful. They emerge right about now, about mid-January, and then they'll last until about Easter in March or April. It's a really easy species because um, it will grow cool, it will grow warm, it'll grow shady, it'll grow bright, and it'll still flower and it'll produce this wonderful profusion of flowers every year that, that lasts for months and months. Um, this little frog at the very end here, this is my rating system for how difficult the species are. Uh, so one frog is easy and then it goes up to five frogs 
and five frogs would be very likely to croak. So that's why they're frogs. So one frog is easy growing, five frogs is likely to croak. Uh, this is the only hybrid that I really put in the presentation. I just, they're fun because they're blooming right now and they all smell really nice. And somebody had a field day naming them all after chips. I don't know what the story is with that, but um, these are all primary hybrids with Dendrobium aberrans, and they all look very similar. No matter what the other parent is, the, the hybrid outcome always looks pretty much the same, which is white with pink spots. But no matter the other parent, all of the offspring smell like cinnamon. They have this really warm cinnamon smell, and they all are very easy to grow. So they get one croak, and um, they're blooming now, so they make really nice uh, Easter gifts and just kind of fun. So I just put that in there. All right, so tiny dendrobiums. This is really like my favorite section, favorite type of orchid is these tiny, tiny dendrobiums. Um, and this is mostly about the section stachyobium. Uh, these are largely found in Thailand, but they are, you know, found across Southeast Asia all the way to the Himalayas and China. Uh, they're usually extremely tiny. The ones that I'm going to talk about are, you know, one to three inches tall. There are some larger members of Stachyobium, but not too many. They grow a lot like a nobly dendrobium. So they'll, you know, they'll have a shorter growth period during the summer. And then they have deciduous leaves that fall off and then they want a cooler, drier winter. But they're kind of fun because they have this short burst of growth in the summertime and then they'll produce their flowers and as they're flowering or as they're finishing flowering they lose those um, leaves. This another really cool feature of the stachyobiums is the bulb shapes. This one is Dendrobium elliationum. This is uh, probably one of the easier ones to buy, one of the easier ones to find. I really like the shape of the bulbs on this one. It just looks like a little poop emoji because it's got a little stack of, of swirls here on the, on the bulb. But it's really cute. This whole plant is probably about three quarters of an inch tall and it fits, it's growing on a little dog sculpture. I should have brought it to show you, but the dog sculpture is probably about three inches long and it's just this tiny little specimen plant growing on a little dog sculpture. But this one's really easy to grow. It's uh, warm to cool growing so you can grow it up to 95 degrees during the summer and it gets down to probably about 45 and it would be just fine during the winter. So it has a really broad temperature tolerance. It, uh, it does need a winter rest. So that just means that it's gonna get a lot of water and a lot of fertilizer during the summer and then it'll lose those leaves. And as it's losing its leaves, it'll flower and it blooms um, when it's lost its leaves. So it gets two croaks because of that winter dormancy. But really it's a pretty easy growing species. And it's also one of the most colorful of the, of the section. Most of the stachyobiums are like green, yellow. This one's pink, purple, and it's very sparkly. It's cute. So this is, this is the flower of that Dendrobium aliatianum. This one is fun because it's really fragrant. It smells like uh, lily of the valley or honey rose smell. It's just absolutely charming and it's super easy to grow. Uh, so it'll, you know, push out its flowers while it still has the leaves. And then as it's finishing flowering and uh, it'll just lose all of those leaves kind of all of a sudden. And then you're left with this sort of scraggly looking thing that you don't water much over the winter. But the flowers, you know, this little plant that fits in the palm of my hand is fragrant enough to fill my whole greenhouse with this, this delightful honey fragrance. So it's a really charming, small, super fragrant plant, and it's very, very easy to grow. Um, this one, probably you wanna keep it a little bit more intermediate, um, but it would probably take intermediate warm just fine. And it's very, very small, only about three inches when it's, when it's in active growth. This is a newer species. This is still section stachyobium, um, but this one has the biggest flowers of the section that I have grown. Um, and they're also pretty long lasting. This one's not fragrant, but the bulbs are probably about an inch tall and they're just the most delightful teardrop shape, just the perfect teardrop. And then it'll have three leaves coming out of the top. And then the, the flowers, these white little flowers that you see 
are about an inch across. So that's enormous for the size of the plant. Um, and I've got what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven flowers here on a, on a one inch tall plant. So they're big and they're really pretty and they're pretty long lasting. This one bloomed earlier than the other stachyobium dendrobiums. This one bloomed in like late summer. So it still had its leaves uh, when it was blooming. I gave this one bright shade and I've always grown it mounted. I've never had success growing these um, potted. They just kind of stay too wet during the summer if I grow them potted, but they seem to like being mounted in bright shade. So I gave this one two croaks. I haven't killed any yet. Uh, so it, it's gonna stay at two croaks until I kill them. This is um, Japanese uh, influenced dendrobium. So these are, kind of like the Neophenicia falcatas, if you've heard of those, the, they were cultivated by ancient Japanese samurai for you know literally hundreds of years. And so the diversity within this one species is really amazing. They are belonging to the same section as um, the nobly dendrobiums, the dendrobium section dendrobium. So they grow pretty much exactly like the nobly dendrobiums. They'll have a, a winter, dormancy where they lose their leaves and then they'll flower in the spring from the second year old canes. I find them pretty easy to grow, but they're sort of a little bit tricky to flower because they like that dry period. And if you don't do the dry period right, you'll get cakeys instead of getting flowers. So if you're getting a lot of cakeys on your nobilis or on your dendrobium maniliformes, then probably reduce that fertilizer, reduce the watering and increase the light. Um, on your plants during the winter. There's so many cultivars of the Dendrobium maniliformes, and some of them are a little bit big, um, like this one in the middle. This cultivar is uh, probably about 10 inches tall, but still quite small. But there's uh, the variegated foliage. These are called tiger stripes. This is just a, a midline stripe, and that's all it has. And then this one on the right here, you can see these leaves are kind of squidgy. That's, uh, it's supposed to be like that. They, they just crinkle these leaves, every new leaf crinkles and even the cane is a little bit crinkly. So within this one species, there's a lot of variation and the flowers are diverse too. There's pink, there's yellow, there's cream. And this, this um, particular cultivar has uh, this yellow picketty variegation on the edge, which is really fun. So if you can get your hands on some Dendrobium manila for me, I really recommend it. They're not hard to grow. You need to get them below like 60 during the winter if you want flowers. You can definitely grow them above 60 and they'll just grow their beautiful leaves because remember they have that gorgeous foliage. You can definitely grow them just for the leaves. But if you want flowers, you really need to get them below 60 for about six weeks in order to produce those flower buds. This is one of my personal favorites. Um, I recently discovered that the flowers smell like cinnamon. You have to stick your nose right up in there, but they're really fragrant. Um, this is a species from Australia, and it's another one that's very temperature tolerant. It can take close to freezing, and it can take you know, upwards of 100 degrees as long as you've got some shade. So very temperature tolerant. These grow on like the sides of rocks and the sides of trees in Australia. And the leaves are about the size of a, a large grain of rice, like a size of, um, what do you call it, a brown, brown rice. Um, so it's a little bit bigger than maybe your average rice grain, but whatever. They're very cute. This is absolutely the tiniest dendrobium and uh, pretty easy to grow. I hear from a lot of my customers that it grows, but it doesn't flower. So how I grow it is I have it hanging off the side of a cattleya pot. So it grows in the same brightness as a standard cattleya and it gets the same watering as a standard cattleya. So that cattleya that's in a six inch pot dries in my environment maybe once a week, you know, maybe even every 10 days. And so that's how often this tiny little thing that fits in the palm of my hand gets watered is a week to every 10 days. So not a lot of water for this tiny little plant. And that's something that I see a lot of my customers doing they have this tiny plant and they think it needs a ton of water because it's really small, but it's really not true. And this is where coming, this is where knowing the culture of your plant is really important. 
is don't overwater these tiny plants. Just because it's small doesn't mean it wants a lot of water. And this is definitely one of those that you can kill with kindness a little too easily. So I gave it three croaks because I hear from a lot of my customers that it, it grows, but it doesn't flower. So if yours is growing and not flowering, I suggest increasing that light and decreasing the water. But I don't give mine any kind of dormancy and it blooms like this pretty much all the time. It's a really satisfying grower. This is probably my favorite dendrobium. Um, this one is just absolutely fragrant. It's uh, this whole specimen, again, it'll probably fit the size of my hand. It's on a piece of cork that's about four by six maybe. And for every cane it has, the next time it grows, it'll grow two canes. And then the next time it'll grow two canes from that. And each of those canes and all of the older canes flower every time it flowers. So you get just masses of flowers. Um, and it flowers for, like this for me about six times a year. It flowers every other month like this. And the only issue that I have with it is that the flowers only last about 36 hours. So it flowers a lot, but it doesn't last a very long time. But it's really fragrant. It smells kind of like a honey grape smell, hyacinth maybe. It's very, very strong, very floral, very pleasant, maybe some orange blossom. And I've never given mine a winter dormancy and it just flowers and flowers and flowers all the time. So it gets one croak because it's a very easy growing plant and it'll grow uh, warm to cool as well. You can definitely grow this one warm. It'll, it would be great for an indoor, um, indoor grow space. And then there's the red form too. I have uh, two plants of this, this species. I have this red one and I have that yellow one on the last slide. And they're fascinating because they never fail to bloom on the same day. I bought them years apart from different breeding, from different vendors, and yet they never fail to bloom on exactly the same day for those 36 hours that it does bloom. So it's, there's some environmental trigger that's triggering them both to bloom at the same time. It's really fascinating. And they have the same smell. This one, I just discovered this this year. I got this from um, Andy's orchids. I don't know if he still has any, but the flowers uh, are the same size and the same smell as that Dendrobium pachyphyllum, but the actual plant is probably about a quarter of the size of pachyphyllum. Pachyphyllum is about an inch tall. This one is about a quarter of an inch tall. So it's just an absolutely tiny little plant. And it seems to have the same growth habit, which is it flowers about every other month and then the flowers last for about a day. So it's really cute. This whole little plant is probably about two and a half inches from top to bottom. Oh, it's way cute. I'm glad I got one of those. All right, Bulbophyllums. These are definitely most diverse orchid genus. I only have like three of them in the presentation, um, but there's a lot of really tiny Bulbophyllums. They're not too popular with my customers, so I didn't want to talk about them too extensively. They're not all stinky. This is a total misnomer um, about the bulbos, especially the tiny ones are not stinky. This is probably the tiniest one you can find on the market. And uh, this is from, uh, a, this is a picture from a friend of mine and he grows his in a glass of water. Just, you know, a glass on his nightstand, he sticks the plant inside of his glass of water and he's got about an inch of water at the bottom of the glass and the, the water just barely touches the bottom of the mount and it kind of wicks that water up the mount. And then he'll mist it, you know, every other day or so. And he's got it on a windowsill that gets medium bright light. Uh, and so he's grown it better than I've ever grown it in my greenhouse. I don't know why he manages to do it so much better than me, but his little uh, cup of water trick seems to work for him because he's got these wonderful flowers on there. Those Green bulbs, by the way, for reference, those are about the size of a pinhead. So they're about three millimeters across at most. Uh, I give this one four croaks because I tend to get a little bit of dieback in the winter. Like you can kind of see that happening here with this, this yellowing part here. Sometimes the older bulbs tend to die back in the winter. So I like to keep it a little bit drier in the winter and that seems to reduce that bulb dieback a little bit. They're really fun, they, they grow 
you know, one new bulb a year pretty much in each direction. And then they have one tiny little leaf and it's a deciduous plant, so it'll lose its leaf. And then that's your signal to reduce that watering once it loses its leaf. And then it'll push up a flower about a, two months later and you get this tiny little orange flower that's poking up out of the bulb. So these are really cute. They just look like a little algae or a little fish bubble or something like that. This is a fun species. Uh, these have totally weird bulbs and I'm just totally enchanted by them. Um, these are from Thailand. And as far as I know, the only, uh, the plants that are available on the market today, they all came from one population of, of plants in the wild. They were, you know, the seed was collected from one population in the wild. So there's not a lot of um, diverse cultural information about this species. It's new to the market, it's new to cultivation, and we only have this one data point as far as where the plants were growing in nature. There's just not a lot of cultural information available. But we grow them like a catacetum. So we water them when they're growing and we don't water them at all when they're not growing. And they have these adorable little bulbs that look like moon craters or cheese or something like that. They're just the most bizarre little pseudo bulbs. But they're just like the manila formate in that they're gonna grow a new pseudo bulb you know, it'll come out from, from the sides of one of the old ones. And it grows two leaves on the top. And then those two leaves are gonna flatten out and they're gonna create this weird little bulb. And then those leaves are gonna fall off and die. It's deciduous. And then you wanna stop watering throughout the winter. And about, eh, about this time when it's, you know, around the solstice, you're gonna start to see spikes. And then these bloom in the spring. And then after they'll fin they're finished blooming, they're going to produce new growths. And that's when you want to water again. So they have all of their energy stored in their pseudobulb to, to get them through the winter. Um, so we don't, we don't water them in the winter. It's really interesting. But they're a cool, cool novelty if you're into, into weird bulbs and weird flowers. This is another new species. This one's from New Guinea. I've always grown this one intermediate, but um, it would probably do fine intermediate warm. The flower is probably about an inch and a half tall, and it's just like the most bright, crisp yellow that I've ever seen. If you Google this species, you might see some with longer tails on the, on the petals here. I guess those are sepals. Uh, you might see some longer tails, but mine has, has shorter tails. But the plant, this is a one inch pot that it's growing in here and it's just some packed sphagnum. And so I water the sphagnum when it's approaching dry and it's just utterly cute and a really tiny satisfying plant because it produces flowers pretty much throughout the entire summer. So this one's becoming more available and I found it to be really easy growing. I just grow it on the bench um, next to like miniature cattleyas so it gets medium light. Moving on from bulbos, uh, you know, the Angraecoids, I love them. Maybe they're not so popular with my customers, but there are some really, really cute miniatures that exist within the Angraecoid um, family. And this one is probably the best miniature that's easy to grow and easy to get. This is Orangus punctata. It's a Madagascar species. And the plant itself, I don't know if you can see behind the flowers, but the plant itself is these red leaves here. And that is about a two inch plant uh, from leaf tip to leaf tip. These flowers here from tip to tail are about two inches. And then you have this four inch nectary, like we saw, um, I think it was Paul showed us his, um, or Peter, was it Peter? Sorry, he showed us his engracoid that had that long spur down the back. These orangas have the same thing. Um, they have this beautiful moth pollinated spur down the back, which is about four inches. So you have a basically a five inch flower on a two inch plant. And then you can get multiple flowers from one plant. And you just, it's just amazing to see one of these in flower. And they're easy to grow. You grow it like a Phalaenopsis. Um, they're a little bit more temperature sensitive than a Phalaenopsis. And they don't like salty water. So if, you're, if you have really high salt water or really um, 
uh, high calcium water, they're not going to like that. They, they prefer uh, lower TDS water. But that's really it. If you, other than that, if you treat it like a foul, meaning medium bright light, water it when it's just dry and um, intermediate warm temperatures. Ooh, is that? Is that me? <laughs> Sorry. Um, if you keep them intermediate warm temperatures, they're going to flower pretty much every August, which is really fabulous. And they just, oh, they're just the cutest. I don't know why I gave it three croaks. I disagree with past Kelly. I think that they're much easier to grow than three croaks. This is a, a newer species on the market. I've seen Equihenera offering these lately. This is Orangus hyaloides. It's named for the hyaloid flowers, which means glass-like. And uh, this one's really easy. It grows just like the last one. Uh, intermediate, warm, you can grow it shady like a Phalaenopsis. This one, you're probably not gonna do so well potted. You gotta grow it mounted. And then it doesn't like that salty water. But other than that, really easy to grow. These flower for me every spring. Uh, this plant is in bloom again, and it's just, just as cute. This entire plant is probably about three inches wide. And uh, it's just totally adorable. I really enjoy these. And uh, intermediate to warm. So these would grow great in an indoor terrarium if you've got warm conditions. This one we're all familiar with. I'm sure a lot of us have killed this plant. Uh, I know I've killed plenty of them. This is Angraecum didieri or Dideri. I, I mentioned this one because I want to point out this, this growing hack that um, I'm sure a lot of my customers are familiar with. But we call it the jar method. And it works for a lot of these, these Angraecoids. The Angraecoids have really sensitive roots and they like the humidity around the roots, but they don't like moisture around the roots. So this is, this is different than water culture because the plant is not remaining in water. And what I want you to do is put your urine graecum, DDRI works great, some of the other smaller angraecoids, and you put it in this jar and you've got some kind of pin that holds it in place or just a piece of wire or something like that. And what you do is you fill that jar with water, you let it soak for 15 minutes, that's all your plant needs to absorb all of its water. And then you pour out that water and your, you know, your roots are nice and green, they've absorbed all their water, and you let that jar and you let that, those roots dry completely over the next two or three days. And by the time the jar is completely dry, all of those roots have turned silver again, you take it and you do the same thing and you soak it and you let it absorb that water. So what this does is it lets the humidity stay around the roots and it lets that, that plant stay humid around the roots, but it doesn't keep it wet and soggy. Sometimes the angraecoids, and especially angraecum didieri, they don't like that soggy media. And so growing them in a soggy old media, they just get this weird bacterial infection. I call it angraecum death, death syndrome. And they just die really quickly and they lose all their leaves and it's very sad. And I've seen it happen countless times with the angraecum didieri. But this method seems to work for a lot of my, my customers and it'll work for um, a lot of the, the smaller, um, the smaller angraecoids. This one, I just bloomed one of these this year. It's really, really cute. Uh, this is probably the smallest Angraecum that you can, you can find on the market. This is Angraecum urshianum. And it's from Madagascar. You will kill this. I killed like so, so many. They're really precious and they're really rare. There's not a lot of them um, left in the world. You know, they, they're being collected and they're just hard to find. Uh, so I bought a flask a couple of years ago and I killed every single one of them. This plant is actually from Madagascar. It's a cultivated plant from Madagascar. And this is the only one for some reason that's ever survived for me. The way that I've grown it is always intermediate and it doesn't get above oh, 80 or so in my greenhouse. So it, it always stays about 80 and then it doesn't dry out for too long. So uh, pretty much like a fowl. So I'll test that, that moss and I don't want the moss to be crunchy dry. I just want it to be spongy, but not like releasing any water when I squeeze it. So it's, it's a little bit moist, but it's not totally dry. 
And here's the, the profile of it. It's just it's like a one inch flower and then it's got a good two or three inch spur. It's just the cutest little thing. So if you can find one of these and you've got intermediate conditions and good water, you should try it because it's really cute. This is another really easy one. This is Angraecum distichum or disticum, named for the distichous leaves, which is uh, braided is what it means. And these little flowers, they sparkle in the sunlight. They're moth pollinated, just like a lot of the Angraecoids. And uh, they smell like cotton candy. It's really cool. They're fun and it flowers a lot. Flowers twice a year, summer and winter. And then sometimes you'll get just spotty flowers here and there really fun to grow. It does like humidity, it does like that pure water, and uh, it's very temperature tolerant, so you can grow it cool to warm and it should be just fine. The only other thing that I want to add is they don't like that, that soggy media. So the jar method would definitely work for this one, um, and it would probably prefer no media to, um, to like a fine or a soggy medium. The way I have this one growing here in the picture is uh, we call it a pot in a pot. So it's got uh, an inner pot, which is like a net pot. And then the outer pot is solid and it's got, you know, drainage around the edge. But the inner pot is empty or it has maybe just one chunk of, of bark or cork. And then the roots kind of grow in between the space between the, the net pot and the, the outer solid pot. So the roots, you know, are getting a lot of humidity from from this solid pot, but they're not getting that cloying wet media that um, the ungracoids don't like. All right, let me get a drink of water here. So this is really my, oh, my, my love is the miniature cattleyas. And Susie asked me to talk about um, the Sophronitis and the mini cats. So this is for you, Susie. Uh, I grow a lot of Rupiculus lalias and Sophronitis in particular. So the Rupiculus lalias, these are usually from Brazil. That not, I'm not aware of any that are not from Brazil. They're um, uh, called rock-dwelling lalias sometimes. And I think that this is kind of a misnomer, this rock-dwelling name, because uh, if you see pictures of them growing in situ, you'll see that they're actually growing like in the crags of rocks in the detritus in the crags. So they're not growing in gravel, like I have this one growing in the picture. I've never seen a picture of one growing in, in gravel. What you see is they're growing in the, in the cracks and there's detritus in the cracks and then there's a plant in the detritus. So rock dwelling is a bit of a misnomer, but they do usually grow in and among rocks. They usually grow in near full sun. So when you see them in situ, they're usually ugly little things. They're purple and they're, you know, they're just stunted and weird looking, but in, um, in a greenhouse cultivation, they can look really quite pretty and very succulent. And they're very temperature tolerant plants. You know, some of them can take near freezing to upwards of 100 degree um, temperatures. And this is, this is one that um, is probably more cool growing than warm growing, but it can, it can probably take near freezing to 90 degrees or so. Uh, they do a whole lot of nothing, and then they suddenly grow in flower, kind of like a bifoliate cattleya. You know, they just kind of sit there forever, and then they'll suddenly put out a new growth, and they'll flower from that new growth. And they root from that new growth, too. It's really important to repot these, just like, just like bifoliate cattleyas. You want to repot these when they're growing their new roots, because they only root out once a year. So it's really important to, to pot them just before they start those new roots. And that's unfortunately usually when they're, when they're flowering, just like the bifoliates. So I put these and I grow them on my bright light and ignore shelf. So I put them up on the shelf way up at the top of the, of the greenhouse. And it gets like probably 4,000 foot candles up there. It's pretty darn bright. So I'm growing like brassivolas and I'm growing bifoliate cattleyas. So it's as near to full sun as I have in my greenhouse. But I know Andy, Andy's orchids, he grows these in near full sun. And they like a little bit drier in the winter time. This is a slightly larger species. This is Lely etambana. It's still Brazilian, very easy to grow. They like um, these moth 
pots that I have. So I grow them in, um, in a clay pot with sphagnum moss. And um, they like to be dry like a cattleya, but they seem to like the, the moss. I, I haven't quite figured out why, but I've tried growing them in bark and they just don't like it. The, the roots don't grow in bark. And I think it's a pH issue. They like slightly acidic um, media. And some of the, the bark brands that we can get, the, the media is actually quite alkaline. Uh, so I think that, it, that it's a pH thing. And also the, the moss tends to stay wet longer and it stays moist um, more evenly over a longer period of time than bark, which bark, you know, you water it, it stays watered and then it dries rather quickly once the, once the water has run out of the pot versus moss, you know, it stays wet. And so the plant has a little bit more time to take up that, um, that water from the pot. I gave this one two croaks. I think it's really easy and it's got these just great flowers. The Rapiculus lilies, they don't produce a ton of flowers, but when they do produce, they're very, very cute and they're very small plants. So these are really great if you're growing under um, very bright lights and you don't have a lot of shelf space because they're very compact plants and um, they're, you know, they can take a lot of light and they can take high temperatures. So growing quite close is, um, is okay with these guys. So moving on from Rupiculus lalias, Sophronitis, of course, both of these um, genera are now Cattleya. I know that, I just refuse to assimilate. I find Sophronitis um, to be a bit more descriptive uh, over the, the differences of these tiny, tiny Cattleya species. The culture is much different of the Sophronitis than it is of the, the Cattleyas. So that's why I like to keep them separate. Uh, the Sophronitis cernua is probably the easiest Sophronitis to grow. It's also warm growing, so it's, it's suitable for growing indoors if you don't have that nighttime temperature drop. Uh, I found that they like to have um, a lot of space on their mounts. They don't like tiny mounts, and I just learned this recently, but um, they don't like to like have their roots dangling. They really like to just be attached to something. So if you have this little plant, um, stick it on a big mount and then those roots kind of just grow all around the mount and they're much happier plants and they seem to grow much faster when the roots are actually attached to something. I've just observed this this year. I used to grow them on tiny little mounts and they just they never grew. They kept rotting and they never grew but I put them on bigger mounts and suddenly they're much happier. So this one grows like a cattleya that it likes bright light and it likes to dry well in between waterings. Especially in the winter time, you're gonna want this plant to be dry most of, it, most of the time. Um, water it well when you do water it, but let it dry out and let it stay dry for a day or two in between waterings. Otherwise you're gonna have root, root loss and you're gonna get um, rotten bulbs. So this one's definitely the easiest of the Sophroninus and it grows really well potted. It grows really well mounted. I always grow them mounted, but I have the space for that kind of thing. So this is a, my probably the second favorite and second easiest growing is Sophronitis brevi pedunculata. Uh, these have huge flowers. This little pot that I'm holding in my hand is a three inch pot. So that's a good four inch flower that I'm holding in my hand. And this plant had uh, seven flowers that were that size this year. So this tiny little three inch pot had, you know, seven enormous flowers on it. Uh, the big thing about Brevi pedunculata, it is warm growing. So you can grow these indoors, you can grow them really well. But the thing about Brevi pedunculata is it doesn't like salt. So if you're watering with a lot of fertilizer, if you're watering with hard water, you're gonna need to flush your pot or flush your mount with um, pure water or just use pure water on it because they really don't like that salt buildup. They'll grow really well for a year or two or three. And then finally, they'll just kind of start rotting and they'll just slowly sort of melt away because they don't they have all that salt buildup on their roots. Um, but this one grows a little bit warmer. I have a cool intermediate listed on here. Yeah, I mean, it's usually listed as cool intermediate, but this one, this one will grow warmer so you can grow it indoors. I gave it three croaks because um, it does have a little bit of a finicky um, root system. They root out once a year, and if you kill those roots, 
you're going to struggle until next year when um, when they root out next. Oh, this one's my favorite. This is Manticure. It's named after a region in Brazil. These are pretty tolerant. Um, they grow best on tree fern, I found, and they like to be moist. They really like to be moist. And this is one of the reasons why I like to keep Sophronitis separate than Cattleyas, because we tend to keep Cattleya dry. And when I first started growing Sophronitis, I grew them like Cattleya. I kept them dry, and I thought they needed to dry in between waterings. And then somebody taught me, no, no, they need to stay moist. And I started watering them more, and oh my god, now I'm obsessed with Sophronitis. And you can't stop me from buying Sophronitis every time I see one. So. These grow best on tree fern. The roots just kind of grow all over the tree fern and in and out of the tree fern. And these little tiny bulbs are about the size of a pea. And then these flowers are about two inches. So this one's really easy, but it does need that cool winter. So they need to get at least 55 or lower in the winter time. And they usually flower right about now. So you can, you can probably find one in bud if you're buying now. Um, but this is probably one of the fastest growing Sophronitis. It usually produces two new um, growths per old growth. So you'll get, you know, your flower doubles in size every year and uh, you get a flower on every new growth. So they're really, really cute. This little plant on a three inch mount gives me three big red flowers. Super cute. This is another Manticure. Um, this is a a redder, like a rosy red flower, rather than an orange red flower. I guess you can't see the difference so well on my screen. This is a new species. Some people say it's just like Manticure. I don't know. It looks pretty much like Manticure. <laughs> but anyway, they're calling it Sophronitis mini autumn. It's probably found in a different region in Brazil. Same culture. I've always grown these potted. Here's coccinia. I'm sure you guys have all seen this one. This is definitely the most popular, but it's also the most difficult to grow. The darn thing, it's salt sensitive. It doesn't like um, warm temperatures and it doesn't seem to like uh, existing at all, really. It prefers to die. So they have very large flat flowers and most of the ones that you can buy these days are um, tetraploids. So they have really big, very red, flowers with heavy substance, which is of course what judges like when they're looking at a plant. But it also makes them kind of hard to grow. Um, they're, I don't know, the, the best way that I've found to grow them is in, um, uh, what do you call it, a clay pot with moss. And then uh, you keep that moss moist. You don't let the moss dry out. And that seems to, to work pretty well with the, the coccinias. The reds, they're definitely better in the wintertime. Coccinia usually flowers in the winter and in the uh, summer, but the summer flowers are orange or kind of a um, neon red. And then in the winter, they're more of a rougey red. They're darker red. So the, the bright light and the cool temperatures really brings out the red. Here's Wittigiana. This is the one pink, uh, pink member of the genus. All the rest of them are red. I gave this one five croaks because it's the coolest growing and it seems to be very stubborn to grow roots. The best way that I have found to grow these, oh, here's Pygmaea. This one's very cute too. These flowers are about the size of a quarter. This is the smallest member of the genus. The best way that I have found to grow these is by growing them horizontally mounted. Um, so you can kind of see this wire poking out here um, this is like a coat hanger, so I hang this on my, um, from my roof in the greenhouse and it hangs horizontally rather than hanging it vertically. So if you hang a mount horizontally, when you water that, that mount, the roots and the, the moss have more time to absorb that water because the water gets trapped in those cracks and bumps and holes. You can see here there's there's a root that's growing into a hole right here. When I water this mount, all of these holes are going to fill up with water. And so when I hang something horizontally, it's going to have more time to absorb that water versus if I hang it um, vertically, that water is just going to immediately run off. And that works for some things, but Sophronitis, like I mentioned several times, they like to stay a little bit more moist. 
and they like to be even moisture. They don't like big, wet, big, dry periods. And so growing horizontally lets you um, control that moisture a little bit more evenly and doesn't make such big, wet, dry periods. Um, here's a Rupiculus lalia that's grown horizontally mounted. Uh, I just took this picture today and it's in bud and I'm really excited about it. But this is without a doubt the best way to grow Rupiculus lalias and Sophronitis is mounted horizontally. The roots just love it, the plants love it, and I just, I've had great luck mounting them horizontally. Um, I just have this one laying on my bench. It's not even hanging. I have a hanger on it, but it's always been laying on my bench and it's been happy that way. The other way I grow them is potted. I mentioned this earlier with that Lelia etembana, but here's a little better explanation of it. Um, you get a clay pot and you hollow out the bottom of the pot so that it's just, um, instead of a tiny little quarter inch hole, the entire bottom of the pot is, is hollow, is empty. And then you take your plant and you wrap about an inch worth of moss around the top of um, around the top of the roots. So when you stuff it in the pot, the bottom half of the pot is empty. So there's only moss in the top inch of the pot or so. And so what that does is it'll create this um, cavity down here, one, that the roots can grow in. And then two, um, this clay pot here in combination with the moist moss kind of creates an air conditioner for the plant. So it works exactly like a, a swamp cooler, an evaporative cooler. As the moisture evaporates out of this pot, which it, it will because it's a porous material, uh, it cools the pot. And I've observed this. I've taken a, a thermometer, a laser thermometer, and measured the temperature of the moss in a clay pot versus the temperature of the moss in a uh, plastic pot. And the clay pot was about five degrees cooler than the plastic pot. So you can kind of get away with growing slightly cooler growing species um, in these clay pots rather than in plastic pots. So if your conditions are just slightly too warm, you can kind of get away with growing um, cooler growing species. Pleurothalids, I think a lot of people are afraid of pleurothalids, but they can be really charming. This is one of the, the easier growing Mastivalias. This one's warm growing. So you can definitely grow this in like an indoor terrarium. And it smells like cream soda. It's really fragrant. Not a lot of the Mastivalias are fragrant, but this one's really fragrant. It smells like cream soda. And it's easy growing, blooms around Christmas time. So it's, it's not a great show plant because it's always finished blooming by show time. But it's really easy and it's really floriferous. Mastvalia strobellii. Grows shady and I like to keep it really moist. I like the Mastivalias because you kind of always know when they need water. If they're not wet, they need water. This is another warm grower, Floribunda, of course named for its floriferousness. And uh, this one is really cute. This is a pink cultivar. It comes in white, it comes in tan, it comes in even yellow. And then there's this, this cute pink cultivar and then there's a spotted white and purple one too. But this is really easy to grow and it flowers a lot. This one flowers for me three times a year. It'll flower in the fall when the weather starts to get cool. It flowers again around Christmas time and then it flowers again in January. And it flowers on the same spikes. So it, it just does a lot of flowers. It's really cute. And it's very easy, but you do need some kind of a humidity environment for this one and the, and the Strabellia. You need some kind of humidity. This one, this is only suitable if you have like a really good terrarium with like a 95% or higher um, humidity. But it is a warm grower, so it grows really well indoors. Shady light. This, this um, flower is probably about the size of a dime and the whole plant is, you know, an inch across. It's really cute. It's, you know, just absolutely exemplifies miniature orchid growing as this cute little species. Uh, how I grow it is I keep it wet and I use RO water, but I add a quarter strength fertilizer with every single watering. And that's pretty much how I grow everything, but especially the pleurothalids. They don't like high salty water. So if you are you know, using RO water 
and then suddenly you're mixing in full strength fertilizer and you spray your pleurothalids with it, it's going to be really salty. You know, fertilizer brings the salts up in your water. And so you want, instead of suddenly inundating your plants with a lot of salt, you want to introduce that more steadily. And so using quarter strength every fertilizer really helps, um, helps the plants get their fertilizer without overwhelming them with salt. So the pleurothalids grow really well that way. This is Lepanthes calodictyon. This is really more of a jewel orchid. This is a flower right here. It's a teeny tiny little bug flower, but they're really grown for their beautiful um, foliage, which is kind of like a turtle back. And this leaf is probably about the size of a quarter. So they're pretty cute. And this is a worm grower. So it would grow great in a indoor terrarium. This is probably the smallest plant that I have in my collection. I got it on eBay. I have not seen many for sale. Andes might have them, but um, the leaves are just tiny. They're like three millimeters long. This is growing on a wine cork here, you can see, and it's got these beautiful little white flowers. So it's grown well for me warm indoors, but it, it has not flowered warm. Uh, it was growing out in my, in my, um, greenhouse when when I took this picture and it had those flowers. So I think it likes cooler temperatures to flower, but it's been growing fine, warm, so I don't want to, I don't want to mess with it, but it is a really cute little plant. So if you can find one of those, I definitely recommend it. This is my favorite. This is the species that got me into orchids. It's cute. It's floriferous. It's easy growing. You really got to get one of these. You can grow this one just about anywhere. Uh, this is Lepanthopsis astrophora, warm to cool growing. I've grown this cool, I've grown it intermediate, and I've grown it warm. Probably grows best intermediate and medium shade. So uh, you'll see if you're giving it too much light, they'll, it'll get like kind of purple on the leaves. And I'll show you in the next slide. It likes a lot of water, but it likes to get lightly dry in between waterings. And what I like to do is I like to put uh, live moss on the on the mount. And I like growing pleurothalids this way because I can look at the moss um, and I can uh, know when the moss is wet or dry. Orchids don't wilt like moss does. So if the moss is looking dry and wilty, I water it. Um, here's a close up of the picture or of the flowers. They're really cute and pink. And then this is a, a little hack that my customer has come up with. She grows it in a little jar. So it's just this kind of open little jar and she's got a little bit of water down here with some bark. And then she's got her plant sitting inside this little open jar. And she's got it sitting on a windowsill. It gets medium bright light. She waters it when it's dry, but this little jar with a little bit of water down here is just enough humidity for this little plant to grow. So she doesn't need a big fancy terrarium. She just grows it in a cute little jar. And it looks super cute on her windowsill and it's still flowering. Look, it's got flowers on it. So it's growing just as well as mine. It's just a younger plant. And you can kind of see that purpling that I was talking about. So this is just, just on the edge of too much light, but it still looks pretty happy. All right, just a few more guys. Miscellaneous paths. I included this one in here because it grows really well in New Mexico. We get really high calcium in our water. And these Chinese paths tend to really like calcium. Uh, so our water works really well for these Chinese paths. But um, if you are using RO water or um, rainwater or uh, distilled water, you're going to need to add some kind of supplemental calcium into the, into the fertilizer in order to grow these well. But they tend to be really small plants, like eh, six inches or so across the newer plants. And then they'll have these big, big flowers with lots of spots and they're heavy and they're waxy and they last a long time. I don't grow a lot of paths, but uh, they're, they're really charming. These are in season now, path fairy on them. These are used to be super hard to find, but now they're, they're a lot more common. Uh, it's the same thing. This is um, uh, one of those ones that's a little bit cooler growing, likes a little bit more calcium in the water, but it stays really small but it has very tall spikes. So it might not grow so great under artificial lights because it has a really tall, tall, tall spike. But this one is easy peasy. I definitely recommend getting a hold of one of these if you can. This is one of my favorites. It's ridiculous because it has this enormously long name 
and then a tiny, tiny little plant. Terraceris semiterritifolium for a plant that's two inches wide. I think it's silly when they give them a big long name for a tiny plant. But these little flowers smell like lemons and it grows just like a phalaenopsis. So medium bright light and water it when it's just dry. It only flowers once a year, but I've managed to get quite a number of flowers out of such a tiny little plant. So it's really, really quite satisfying. And this one would grow warm indoors. So it would be great for a terrarium. Pretty darn cute. This is one of my favorites. This is another really fragrant one. Uh, I've heard people describe it smelling like cherry cough syrup, but the ones that I've, um, I've bloomed always smell like a vanilla glade candle. Very fragrant. The plant itself from, from leaf to leaf is about two inches across. And so from the root to the tip is maybe three or four inches. Um, and then these little flowers are about the size of a dime. So these are bright growing and then you water it when it's just dry and they should be fine growing um, intermediate to warm. And if it's not flowering, I hear from a lot of my customers that it's not flowering, grow it a little bit brighter. But this is, I like the fragrant miniatures. So that's a really great one. This is another really common miniature. A lot of people grow this and have a tendency to overwater it. I see a lot of my customers have a tendency to overwater it. And uh, so I grow this one on the side of a cattleya pot, just like that um, Dendrobium taurisae. Just grow it on the side of a cattleya pot and uh, water it when it's just dry. And uh, you will definitely kill it by overwatering rather than underwatering, especially in the wintertime. If it's dry, let it be dry for another day and then another day after that and then water it after that. And then it like super bright light, just like a cattleya. So it's really fun. And then this is the last species. This is a warmer grower, grows really great in terrariums. Harella retricola from Taiwan. Uh, I have a theory with these, they tend to grow really well for two or three years and then they sort of die precipitously. I'm, I think that they're twig epiphytes and they just have kind of a, a um, short lifespan in nature. And so, you know, two or three years is, is pretty much the lifespan of a twig. And so they're just not adapted to a, to a long life on a, on a tree trunk. So I don't know. They grow really well. They smell like lemons. They're wonderful terrarium plants. And um, this, uh, this one was grown next to that Lepanthopsis astrophora in the little jar. So they grow in the same sort of environment. And then there's the pyloric form. It has three lips. Same species, it just has three lips. Pretty cute. All right, quick note on pests. Um, the most pests that I really get on the miniatures is mealybugs and aphids. Uh, usually the scale bugs, they tend to go for the bigger plants. I don't know why, but I get the, the bois of all scale on like miniature cattleyas, and then I get the soft scale often on um, oncidiums. And the mealybugs, they tend to go for the minis, and the aphids, they tend to go for the minis. Um, all of these, you're going to need to treat more aggressively because uh, they can really take over a mini population quite quickly. Uh, so I, I like to rotate with neem and then the imidacloprid. I also use pyrethrins, which is a, a natural um, a natural pesticide derived from marigolds. So you can rotate two pesticides, you know, use imidacloprid one week, use the pyrethrins the next week, use neem the next week, and you want to rotate each week with a new pesticide and treat, you know, at least two or three weeks um, to try and get that entire population down. And that's just good bug control. Um, in my opinion, healthy plants, you know, they have better protection for themselves, they get fewer bugs, they're more able to take care of themselves, and they're more able to um, uh, prevent against uh, a big takeover of evil bugs. So, you know, increasing your humidity and taking better care of your plants and again, catering your, your plants to your grow environment is going to lead to healthier plants and fewer bug problems. So I think that's it. I am finished. Maybe I should unmute all, all of you and you can ask me questions if you want. Let's see.
Test and. Wow. There okay. We go. I think we're getting there. I can hear Susie. Okay. So let's see if we can unmute everybody. I have to ask you to unmute yourselves. So you may have to do it yourselves. Kelly, that was amazing. All right, good. I have, I have like five pages of notes. <laughs> so okay, good. Do. so oh, you're not oh. all asleep then. No. Ooh, no. Kelly, I have a question right off the bat. Yes, the humidifier that you have in your, your, your tank that's in your house, mm -hmm. um, what is that humidifier that you're using? Okay, I don't know the exact brand name. I can get that to you. Um, one thing, the, the humidifier is just a basic cold and flu kind of humidifier. Mm -hmm. uh, the only thing that we shop for when we're buying a humidifier is the ability to clean the inside. Mm -hmm. um, those humidifiers really accumulate a lot of gunk mm -hmm. and um, people don't really think to clean them. So you got to be able to open it up and clean it so that you're not getting those, those nasty bacteria in the air that you're breathing. Actually, I was going to have a post on um, High Desert Orchid's page about humidifiers and cleaning, which may happen in the next couple of days because I, I, this is what I do every week and it makes me crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. But the whole thing of how it goes up the tube that goes up inside, yeah. that's really cool. You know, it's pretty simple. Uh, this particular model that we have actually has the, the tube that, that extends up in there, but I have used just, there's like a VIX cold and flu humidifier that has like a teardrop shape to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a little cone that, you know, you can orient towards your face while you're sleeping or whatever. But we just kind of taped the tube to that that um, opening and fed it into the terrarium. You can buy that tube just in the hardware store. Okay. You know, kind of okay, I'm writing notes. Okay, thank you. Kelly, I have a question about the uh, LED lights in your your grow setup. You showed us at the very beginning the industrial sure. setup. So yeah. what uh, what's the what's the spectrum? Is that just a daylight spectrum of five thousand roughly? Um, well, that's a complicated question. Uh, it's called a full spectrum uh, LED light, but you know, full spectrum to company A might mean something different than full spectrum to company B. Mm -hmm. So um, I can show you the exact spectrum. Basically, we just wanted something that had a, a higher CRI rating, more similar to sunlight. Mm -hmm. um, so typically, the more higher the CRI rating, the more similar to uh, sunlight it's going to be, and then the more color spectra within that light spectrum. Okay, so that's not that's not a hard fast rule. Don't quote me on that, but generally, you're looking for a high CRI rating when you're looking for um, a light so spectrum. Simplistically, daylight spectrum. Yeah, simplistically. <laughs> daylight has a lot more as far as, as wavelength spectrums than pretty much any light on the market. But if you're shopping for a light, you want to find something that has the most wavelengths as possible, in my opinion. Okay. Cool. I have questions. So if anybody else wants, you just got to jump in because I've, I've taking a lot of notes, I have questions. So when you talk, I remember hearing about the jar method of growing the egg, uh, the Ditteri. Uh -huh. And when you had the Vanda cherry blossoms available and I bought one and I was researching yeah. it, I saw somebody did the same thing with it. Oh yeah. So my question is, and it's in my big tank and it's doing, doing well, um, but with a Vanda, would you let it do the same thing where it would dry out to the point that the roots are silver? Mm -hmm. Yeah, with Avanda, I probably would do that. You know, they're about the same in, in that they like to approach dry and then be okay. watered soon after. Okay, because I've been sort of like, yeah, I kind of keep the roots green, but I could try letting it dry out a little bit more. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, folks? No, that was amazing. Was All right, great. Really? And Harry, we have a talk about artificial lighting where I talk in, about spectrum in depth. So if you guys want to hear me back, I, I'd be happy to give that talk. Okay. Okay. And, uh, you, and yet another one. Look at what I have here. Yeah. Yes. Yay. 
and I haven't taken it out of its basket that it came in and it's in my little cool tank. So it's average is about 65 degrees and it's 99, 98% humidity. And it, is that okay? Or should I try and put it in the pot thing? You know, I think that pot is fine how you've got it. You just want to make sure that you're getting a nighttime temperature drop for that one. It, it goes down about 55 or so. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Hey, Kelly. Yes. Kelly, by the way, uh, the water we get here, at least our munis municipal water, is really amazingly salt free. Mm, lucky you. We're very lucky. Yeah. Mm. That's good. That's a good starting point for growing minis. Good water. Anything else, folks? Well, that was just mm -hmm. awesome. awesome. Thank you. Oh, you guys are great. Thank, Thank you so much you. for really having me. Thank you. Great opportunity. Mm -hmm. All right. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. All Kelly. right. Bye. 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 Stay healthy, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye now. Thank you, Kelly.